Hello and welcome uh, to the Social Isolation and uh, Loneliness Collab Lab. My name is James Ibrahim and JR is my co-host. Um, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and in doing so, um, recognise the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and live. Um, I'm at the moment on the lands of the Ngaro people and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, I'd also like to uh, take this opportunity to acknowledge all, the, all of those living without support in the community um, and those suffering from social isolation, loneliness and the impact of that. Um, so welcome to the Collab Lab. It's great to have you here. Uh, it's a big audience and we know you're here from all parts of the country and many different disciplines, professions, job roles. Uh, and it's excellent because the spirit of today's session is to learn as much as we can about the sort of interdisciplinary and collaborative care. And uh, hopefully by the end of the session, we've got a bit of uh, increased confidence to participate in uh, interdisciplinary collaborative care when responding to mental health presentations where social isolation and loneliness is a feature. And also a better understanding of how uh, interdisciplinary collaborative care can contribute to better outcomes for people um, who are experiencing isolation and loneliness. It's a three-part activity. Uh, in part one, we'll all be together in this main meeting room where we'll be your co-hosts. Um, we'll provide you with an overview of the field of social prescribing and loneliness at the moment, and in particular, um, you know, the impact of, uh, you know, COVID, climate change, and, uh, and, and other um, impacts on health. In part two, uh, this is where the fun begins, and you'll go into moderated breakout rooms. Um, the task will be collaboratively develop, uh, developing a mental health plan for a few uh, vignettes. Um, and they're developed specifically for this activity. You'll be in safe hands with the moderators we've selected for the task to whom you'll be introduced to shortly. And we'll also be dropping into the breakout room. So you might see JR and myself pop in there. In part three, we're all going to return to this main meeting room and we'll share those learnings and insights uh, about the challenges and uh, um, merits and hurdles in engaging with collaborative care, care in this field. Um, mindful of the large numbers, interaction in parts one and three will be limited to a chat feature located on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, while we'll not be um, fielding content related to questions here, you can share either by direct message to an individual delegate or to everyone your own information that you wanted to share. Um, but you can also ask for tech help in here uh, and one of our tech supports will uh, get to you. In part two, the breakout rooms, there'll be a lot of interactivity um, and each moderator will negotiate how this happens directly with their breakout room. That'll be one of your first tasks. So we asked when you enter that room, if you would keep your camera on and your microphone muted as soon as you join the breakout rooms. Um, so yeah, follow the lead of your moderators to establish how you're going to work together in these breakout rooms. Um, JR. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Welcome to the uh, Social Isolation and Loneliness Collab Lab. Um, I suppose uh, loneliness in particular seems more topical, um, particularly in the sort of post-COVID time we're in at the minute. Uh, one out of two Australians have felt, has felt more lonely um, post-COVID. And um, when you add to that all the sort of the last four or five years, honestly, with um, natural disasters, um, bushfires and flooding and those sorts of things, uh, what tends to happen in the aftermath, in the initial period, people um, bond together to, to show that sort of socially cohesive um, and resilient sort of practice. But afterwards, uh, when you lose the things that you're used to, the, the places you work or the uh, places you go and have your leisure and those sorts of things, um, the impacts are quite severe sometimes in terms of that that social bond we have and the, um, the uh, measurable objective and, and subjective sort of um, feelings we have around our relationships and our connection. So loneliness uh, is sort of a reasonably simple concept, really. It's just that that perceived feeling about the number of quality of relationships you have. Uh, so um, where social isolation is actually the objective sort of measure in terms of a lack of social contacts or social participation activities. Um, they both sit in that broader umbrella of social health and there's other aspects and domains like social support, um, reliable alliance, those sorts of things in that. Uh, but why is it a problem? Well, uh, without relationships with others, um, there's links to uh, poor mental health, 
uh, increased healthcare utilization, increased hospitalizations, multimorbidity and mortality. Uh, mental health, uh, since um, this is an interdisciplinary group of professionals, is an easy one to kind of talk about. So some people with severe and persistent mental health, uh, sometimes there's less opportunities to engage in the workforce, and therefore you lose that set of social connections and, and potentially friends. Uh, similarly, if you're in the workforce and you have a long-term workplace injury, that disconnection you feel can result in that isolation from your previous social networks, but also that feeling of loneliness as you recover from your injury. and um, need those sort of uh, instrumental and emotional supports in place. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of, you know, why, why is it a problem, as J.I. was saying, um, th there's always been understanding that it has an impact on health, but really until now, not until now, really, are we starting to appreciate the, the full extent uh, of the impact of, of loneliness and isolation on health in concrete terms. So. Given that the vast majority, uh, oh, this this here is just a graph showing loneliness rates by age, uh, and and just obviously it's important to make that differentiation between loneliness and social isolation, where loneliness is um, a subjective level of uh, uh, satisfaction with those around you, and social isolation is more objective, decreased contact. Uh, and so this is a graph of loneliness across the lifespan. You can see that the um, younger people, eighteen to twenty-five year olds, are quite affected. Uh, almost just as much as uh, those between the ages of 56 uh, and over. So we know that it's a huge link to health um, and that most health outcomes are determined by the social determinants of health. But um, most people don't know that it's as lethal as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, obviously, it's not causal, but there's associations there where we know that loneliness has an impact on health equivalent to that. Um, similar impact on premature death as obesity. Um, it carries a 50% increased risk of dementia and a 30% you know, increased risk of coronary artery disease and stroke um, and it's, you know, a 26% increase in all-cause mortality. As, as you know, health individuals and, and people in, in that role uh, across different fields, we often screen for many things that determine health outcomes like smoking, alcohol, diabetes, uh, you know, we might measure weight, we might look at other things. But loneliness isn't one of those key metrics that we've yet integrated into the standard uh, way of monitoring physical health outcomes, but we're just starting to appreciate that. Um, so how we measure this, JR will run through on the next slide. So sometimes the simplest way to measure things is just to ask direct, question, ask direct questions. Um, are you feeling lonely at the minute or how often do you feel lonely? Uh, there's a number of tools. Uh, the more the more sort of popular and common ones are the ones like UCLA Loneliness or Dijon. Um, in terms of social isolation, that's really just about the number of support someone has. Uh, how many friends do you have? Or do you have friends outside of work? Or those sorts of questions can give you sort of objective measures of those things. And if you're looking at broader things like social support, uh, social provision scale, uh, by the same authors as the UCLA Loneliness Scale, uh, gives you a sense of different dimensions of um, constructive and emotional sort of supports people can provide. Uh, in general, the, the more questions you ask people, and, and I suppose there's a survey fatigue uh, in the present sort of time where people get asked to rate things all the time. So sometimes for um, efficiency, I suppose, but sometimes just to avoid fatigue. If you're asking someone to do a K10 and a PHQ and then you add on a loneliness scale, uh, at some points it feels like... Uh, that person might be lost as a person and becomes a measure. So sometimes just that human connection is sufficient to elicit those sorts of things. Uh, the other thing with loneliness, I suppose, is it's uh, it's a bi-directional sort of thing. So uh, sometimes uh, life events can lead to loneliness and sometimes loneliness can lead to life events. Some of the sort of more protective factors tend to be, um, you know, living with someone else or having a partner, those sorts of things. and. Uh, I guess in the context of recent sort of natural disasters and some of the environmental changes, uh, sometimes it's not as great to live in, in regional and rural communities because there's an inherent sense of isolation, particularly when disaster strikes are feeling separated from those supports and structures. So those things can, can have a bit of a compounding effect. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is really just to sort of illustrate that um, from a policy perspective uh, and from a, from, from a, um, a systems change perspective, um, the landscape is changing and there is momentum uh, behind this. Um, in Australia, it's still a little disconnected, but there are a lot of driving forces to suggest that there's going to be some systemic change to address loneliness and social isolation uh, over the next few years. So some of the documents you can see here, uh, international sort of uh, recommendations, guidelines, consensus sort of uh, um, models and frameworks to implement social prescribing internationally. But then there's also a lot of our own sort of domestic, um, uh, you know, system influencing papers and stuff like that. So we've got the, um, you know, 10-year primary care reform recommendations, which mentions social prescribing multiple times throughout as a way of changing uh, necessary change within general practice. Um, the um, self care for health national blue uh, national blueprint. You know that that mentions it. Um, there's the uh, Queensland uh, imp- inquiry into social isolation and loneliness. Um, the national preventative health strategy. The work that RICGP has done, and not to mention the national um, the mental health commission productivity review, which mentioned uh, multiple times that this kind of thing needs to change. Uh, the you know the, the understanding that I've got at this stage is that it's likely to be um, addressed systemically in Australia, probably through PHNs, um, but there may be other you know um, funding frameworks, and so uh, but there isn't yet a sort of um, single model uh, that we can confidently implement into our nation um, that has been proven in Australia yet, but there have been pilots um, and those pilots we're learning from. And so it does require, we're at a stage where it still requires a bit of creativity and nuance to work out how to implement this into your the way you deliver everyday care. Next slide. So uh, as, a, as a GP myself, you know, um, there are many factors that drive my behavior. Some of them uh, in not a very positive way when it comes to delivering care. Um, so I, th- I think we all work in models where there's things that influence our behavior. If someone was to ask us, you know, um, would you like to do this? We'd say, yeah, we'd love to do this. I'd love to address this more. I'm very passionate about this. Um, but if you will, will you do it? You know, there, that depends on things like um, how much time do you have? You know, uh, what sort of funding model do you work in? Um, is would it be considered part of you know loneliness screening as part of your standard workflow? How would your clients or patients respond to you asking these kind of questions? Um, can you find a way to incorporate it at the right moment, the right time, uh, the right part of the sort of patient or consumer journey? Um, what do you do when you when you'd find out about something? You know, um, if you don't know where to send someone, what, what's next? Um, so. Do you have the tools or awareness or understanding of how then to address something when you identify it in this realm of uh, loneliness and social isolation? And, I mean, are you comfortable with addressing this uh, or do you feel like it's outside of scope? Um, Internationally, there's so many different models um, where there were sort of social prescribing towns. Um, Social prescribing is just one of the models of addressing loneliness. It's probably the most uh, widely accepted and that's the act of you know, referring people out to programs and activities to improve their health and well-being, and um, so a lot of people can do that. There's no, it doesn't necessarily require professional expertise um, to make a recommendation, um, and uh, sometimes we're we're just so preoccupied with things that we might see as more pressing, like um, housing, employment, uh, you know. More, more, more obvious presenting high risk needs rather than addressing someone's social isolation or loneliness. Um, and it's just easier and quicker to focus on the biological and psychological factors, you know, referral to a psychologist, a medication script. Uh, it's much harder to focus on the social environmental uh, factors that um, impact on someone's health. Next slide, thanks. So social prescribing, as James said, is one of the opportunities, I suppose, to address some of the issues around loneliness as one of the components and also any other non-medical things that get in the way of well-being for a person. 
Uh, so it's it's non-clinical. It complements the general health and medical care someone gets. It's directed by the person. It's holistic. Uh, and it's sustainable in the sense that it uses existing community resources. Uh, so, so as much as they're actual, actually sustainable in their own right. So uh, it is possible to exhaust um, the local sort of community capacity to support each other in the current way we do things in that sort of funded system. So over time, I think there'll be opportunities to look at how to uh, reinvigorate some of that uh, community-led and volunteering sort of, um, well, social and community development work in Australia. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, social prescribing in particular addresses a number of the social determinants of health uh, by taking that sort of holistic approach and asking people about the things that would improve their quality of life, you can get a sense of the various aspects so you can make a difference. Um, just looking at this one, getting around, if someone can't get to see their friends or family uh, with transport or, or um, because they can't afford with debts or financial issues um, to actually uh, have a car, get the train, take a taxi, or even their rent. Uh, those sorts of things do tend to get in the way of that social connection and also um, can kind of blur the, uh, the the sense of quality of life and well-being someone has. Um, without things like employment um, or even engaging in exercise groups, things like that, uh, you lose opportunities for social connection and integration. So all those determinants can have impacts in their own right, but all of them tend to be funded in different systems. Uh, which creates a sort of complex environment where you have to be aware of the opportunities available across each of those systems to be able to access them. And the people who are generally uh, the most aware tend to have the most of those things in place anyway. So the most sort of financial ability and access to transport and those sorts of things. So the real trick of social describing is to try to actually create greater health equity by helping people access the things they need. Uh, next slide, please. There's lots of different ways to connect people back into community resources. Um, so in some cases, people go for assisted things that the top path is really just the uh, traditional way of finding community signposted sort of resources. So there's databases um, or, or local networks or even council websites that give you a sense of community things available. Uh, the middle path is the most common social prescribing model, uh, the link worker assisted one, where uh, a health provider, GP, social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, et cetera, um, links a person to a link worker who does that individual plan to look at the sort of things that would be interest to needs and links them to the appropriate activities. Um, alternatively, there's also models where there's digitally enhanced sort of things. So you, you kind of have the health provider link someone directly to digital databases and uh, or directly to the activities they run. So, uh, for example, some GP practices overseas have had a garden where they might link the person right into the gardening program or down in Gippsland. Uh, there's a GP who takes clients uh, and patients out walking. Uh, so that's a direct sort of referral into a, a community activity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so who is social prescribing good for? I mean, technically the answer is anybody um, because all of us would probably benefit from looking at what quality of life means to us and then trying to find out what's available to get there. Uh, but in terms of uh, overseas sort of models and then uh, things de de developed in Australia over the last decade, it tends to concentrate in different groups of people. Uh, people living with mental illness, uh, albeit uh, tends to be mild to moderate, people tend not to like to um, try to to take the more difficult side of trying to create opportunities for people with more severe and enduring mental illness, which is interesting. Uh, chronic diseases. So uh, in southeastern New South Wales at the minute with Coordinare, we're doing a, a large program around anybody with or at risk of a chronic health condition. Uh, and upcoming, there's a, a PANDA study, uh, which is cardiometabolic health and um, uh, nature-based activities. Uh, uh, loneliness and social isolation. This is obviously the topic of the day, but it overlaps with all the things. Um, Inherently, the idea is to connect people to things so they feel uh, less isolated and a better quality of relationships with others. And then all the social determinants of health we just talked about, which um, it, it, don't, there's not a ton of systems, I suppose, that help people figure out how to navigate anything from housing to aged care to transport to education. So the, it exists in little bits everywhere. So Centrelink has bits and pieces and My Age Care has bits and pieces with CareFinder and all those sorts of things. But there's not a single place people can go to make a plan for themselves. The types of activities people can access are quite broad. So uh, there's just group or social activities like uh, a gardening group or a walking group, uh, specific befriending services like Compeer, uh, navigation services, which is, is quite popular, I suppose, in the health space to look at care navigation, but 
Now there's things around practical assistance to access things like my age care, uh, self-sufficiency and skills development classes. So uh, for any of the OTs in the room, obviously, it's always um, good to look at developing capacity and capability to do the day-to-day -day living activities. And you'd see the psychosocial funding across um, all the PHNs for uh, mental health uh, reinforce that idea of creating opportunities to gain new skills. Uh, healthy living, uh, the most popular one for purists in the health system, um, the sort of healthy living and exercise and park run sort of activities, uh, and time banking, effectively a barter system where people exchange their time to do something to benefit another person. Um, someone might do gardening for someone and they might help someone else with their, with their taxes. So that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in, in short, the simple model of how social prescribing works here is uh, there's things that get in the way of well-being on the left side. It doesn't matter if it's financial stress or uh, mental health issues or substance abuse or, or just feeling isolated. Um, and someone uh, links them in, uh, does a needs assessment of some sort and links people to the services that meet those unmet needs. So it's a pretty simple sort of system in a sense. Uh, really, it's uh, entirely person-led if done correctly. Uh, and it really is aimed at improving those various domains of what quality of life is for that person. Uh, next slide, please. And does it work? Uh, well, yeah, the answer it seems to be yes, uh, every every time someone does it. Uh, but the, the tricky thing is it's it's not easy to do um, RCTs and stuff with these sorts of things. So um, in Australia, there's been some work. Uh, we did work with uh, people with long-term uh, work cover claims, so disconnected from work for some period of time, and also people with uh, severe and persistent mental illness and complex needs uh, and other groups. Uh, some of the things we found, obviously, reduced hospitalizations and reduced uh, primary care utilization and allied health utilization. The, uh, the workers' compensation work we did made it easier to actually measure that because they have access to all that medical utilization data. So we could actually see after a little spike in, in that sort of uh, more health literate behavior, um, taking care of their own health and well-being, uh, a quick drop off in terms of utilization of health services and an increase in social participation and activities. Uh, overseas, likewise, a uh, uh, fallen um, a and &E attendances following referrals and reduction in GP visits. Um, in most places, you'll find general improvements in quality of life and well-being and, and various measures of psychosocial wellness. Uh, in Australia, it tends to be things like K10, PHQ, those sorts of things. Uh, in terms of a uh, novel thing, that work readiness and social participation. So I um, mean, Australia led the way in social prescribing in terms of um, long-term workplace injuries and social prescribing. So gratitude to New South Wales government and ICARE for, for funding that sort of research early on. Uh, people felt more ready and able to work after attending things like uh, uh, arts on script or, or photography groups, things like that, uh, equine therapy, more satisfied with the social supports. Um, and they actually participated more in activities as, as you'd expect um, and, and felt more socially connected and had more people they could count on. Uh, so it, it, overall that um, uh, they calculated that to be a net social return of just under $4 for every dollar invested. Uh, next slide, please. So one, one of the struggles is, uh, um, it's, it sounds fantastic, but how do we actually put this into practice uh, when we're facing all the pressures? Myself, for example, um, busy GP, 15-minute appointments, patients waiting in the waiting room, um, you know, it, it's not easy. Um, but I, I found there's particular um, junctures in my clinical care, um, for example, at the point of doing a mental health care plan um, or um, at the point of an over-75 health assessment um, where there's... Uh, it, it's it's highly appropriate because I've got that time to talk about preventative health and health screening and it, it's more acceptable. Patients are sometimes thrown off. Why is the GP asking me about loneliness? What's he going to do about it? Um, but uh, more often than not, it's probably the most, um, you know, the room falls silent and, 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 and people find uh, there's, there's a lot of stigma behind it still to say, yes, I am lonely. Um, but uh, you know, it's it's very difficult. It's it's very difficult to share, and uh, and it's a privilege when people share this with you. Um, so you, they need to be given appropriate time and space. Um, it can't be a tick box question um, which you brush through. Um, so all all of you will have uh, some sort of you know um, intake assessment, stopgap, discharge planning point in the 
care and uh, uh, interaction you have with your your con- you know the consumers that you work with, um, and just considering at what point would it be appropriate to address this? Um, where can I do this in my system as it is now? Um, working out your local available resources. So I mean, the easiest sort of map for a GP has been sort of going to your PHN, asking them about the commission services, looking at local council, um, youth groups, li- local library, um, and then you've got sort of more formal listings like uh, on Ask Izzy or My Community Directory or those kind of uh, databases. And then, um, you know, creating your own sort of community assets. Uh, so, you know, if you have the provisions to, looking at um, bringing people together um, or tapping into existing or linking with existing community assets and resources. Next slide, thanks. Um, and so, you know, what's on the horizon in Australia? Uh, well, looking at um, link work social prescribing to be trialled at scale and evaluated. So PHNs around Australia are looking at these sort of link worker models. Um, capacity building, a massive thing. So um, national community and capacity building um, and, uh, and, and there are also um, other emerging models like the asset-based community development and behavioral activation um, funded programs where you know, health coaches or you know, um, behavioral health clinicians are, are located within areas to you know, health, other health um, places like you know, GP clinics and uh, head spaces and places like that. Um, I'd also just mention education. Uh, it's just starting to work its way into um, the literacy of, you know, of, of doctors and, and things like that, where they're learning about social prescribing. There's now social prescribing student collectives in uh, medical schools and things like that. It's fantastic that it's, it's starting there. So I think the new breed will have um, increased awareness and it will be a bit more business as usual. Next slide, thanks. Uh, yep. So this is just a list of some resources. There's lots of things you can, I mean, if you Google social prescribing, um, you, you'll get a list of general resources. And if you add Australia, you, you'll get another list. Um, I know colleagues at ADMA who are in the moderator rooms would probably also suggest you just uh, search ADMA and social prescribing to get a list of local examples of social prescribing in different parts of the country. Uh, and as a lead-in, I suppose, um, as the next thing I'd like to introduce to you, our moderators for the next part of this, uh, Christine Callahan, Chris Lyons, Kayleen Ryan, and Slade, who will lead the breakout rooms. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so... Uh, I'll just give it a couple of minutes till everyone joins this uh, this group session um, where we're all back in together with the moderators. Um, so as I was a uh, fly on the wall uh, across the different sessions, um, what was what was most interesting was the how how varied and experienced um, the people that are attending this um, conference are. And I think out of respect of that, um, experience and expertise. Um, what I'd like to hear from the um, uh, breakout room moderators would be, as we go into this next stage in Australia and hopefully to start to implement this, um, what were some interesting insights or, um, or things that you'd want to share with the group uh, that some of your breakout room uh, members shared with you? Was there anything in particular in terms of considering how this is implemented um, the, the way in which uh, it's it's delivered to people because I heard um, many different um, thoughts and considerations. I'd like to hear from the moderators. What were some special insights um, that some of our wonderful experienced, uh, you know, conference attendees um, might have shared with you? It's Christine here. I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. So um, I, I would just like to um, reflect as well that the group was, in, you know, incredibly diverse, but had so much knowledge um, and kind of understanding of, of the range of supports. And I think they, one of the thing, things that really kind of interested me was the kind of the way it was was reframed. And in, in, in some ways, 
um, becoming lonely and isolated was almost um, as an impact of loss of role identity. So at major transition points in people's lives, and, you know, we talked a little bit about all the, you know, the different transitions that, you know, you go through in, in your life. So really thinking about, you know, from, from a social prescription angle, you know, it, it's absolutely critical at those major transitions. So how do you build capacity in the system at major transition points for people, I think, was, another, was a really important kind of element. Um, I think the other thing that I, I saw from everybody that spoke was um, very much a focus on person-centeredness. So I think that overwhelmingly people were, you know, it, it's about what that person what, what's at the heart of that person? What did they love to do before? What do they love doing now? What might they love doing in the future? And and, and going on the journey with them to kind of um, experience that rather than, you know, just a service system that kind of, this is what we have and therefore this is what you get. It was much more about, just, you know, that kind of co-design, I suppose. Um, and really, I, I, I loved um, the concept of social prescription as a way of recreating an identity. Um, and that, to me, was a beautiful concept. Um, so thank you for um, the, the person that said that. You know, it really is about recreating identities that might have been lost um, and, you know, reframing, you know, um, empowering people um, and capacity building in the system. So that was some of the great things that I heard. I might jump Thanks, in if that's OK. Is that all right, James? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to echo the point around sort of um, the really understanding where people are at that you picked up, Christine, I think. Um, so first of all, thank you, Group R to Z, for being such a great group to work with. Um, so I think really what I heard was sort of people really thoughtful about where people are at and really understanding where's this person at, what's going on here, and actually, um, you know, what's really going on here? Because I think what we all know is that somebody sometimes might say to us what's going on because they think that's what we want to hear, whereas it's not actually the truth. Um, and actually, they're sort of trying to put a brave face on it or whatever. So I think these things are really important. So I think that was um, one piece. I think the other piece also um, that I heard coming through our conversations loud and clear was not, um, not being in a hurry to rush things. And really understanding where somebody's at and understanding that these conversations take time. Um, and so it's that sort of duty of care of understanding what's what's happening here. But also, you know, I just was sharing with my group. I've just been off to London with NHS England, etc. And we were at Bromley by Bow at one of the days. And they were talking about the fact that it, sort of, it wasn't until the fifth conversation with a link worker that sort of information was coming through about what was really happening. And so we can't rush these conversations sometimes. And it's a balance, I think, when you're working with people of not sort of trying to sort of get to solutions too quickly. And it's managing that cadence of where they're at versus sort of um, where, you know, we might be at. And I think that's just an important reflection for all of us. And I think um, then the last piece in terms of some of the questions, but around collaboration, I really loved the way that... Um, you know, the team was sort of thinking about different people in their community who were supports and how those supports work together, but also making sure then that that person has got a warm referral, but then there are no gaps. Because I think sometimes, you know, the, the community needs to be wrapped around a person and it's making sure that they're getting the support that they need and there's an accountability there. And so, again, you know, just wanted to thank um, the group for just being so honest and really very thoughtful the vignettes we looked at were number one, um, which was uh, Patricia, and then number six, which was, um, if I've got it right, is, uh, I'm about to say Brad, but let me just check myself, Nick. So quite different situations. And by the way, I suppose the other thing, James, just to mention, you know, we had, um, you know, 72 year old lady in our first example, increasingly isolated and withdrawn and risk of falls. And then in scenario six, um, we had a gentleman first, um, uh, first, Im uh, first uh, immigrant coming into Australia, he'd lost his job and then sort of lost his sense of belonging and also had financial worries. So, you know, sort of thinking through, you know, uh, female, male, different contexts of what that might look like and what might be going on. Kayleen? 
Hi, sorry, I had a bit of trouble getting into the room again. I'm having major internet problems today, which I normally don't have. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, we had, uh, we looked at um, Patricia as well, Sean, so vignette one, and also Brad. So an older lady and then a younger guy. Um, we talked about um, the range of wonderful services that are available that you can um, reach out to, including neighbourhood houses, libraries, men's sheds, um, etc. We did touch on um, how um, feeling productive, as a person who is experiencing this, it's about feeling um, productive, um, feeling, um, you know, some worth. Um, what can they share with other people um, when they're feeling isolated? What have they got to give? Um, and so, yeah, we, we spoke, a, we touched a lot about, um, you know, providing something, having something to offer um, and that feeling of productive. Along those lines, we also talked about, um, as you touched in your opening presentation, about that sense of belonging because you can be in a group and then not necessarily feel like you belong in the group. We also um, spoke a little bit about how there might be some specific needs for men so um, and the way men might seek out help or want help. Uh, we all know, um, and, and even just interacting with each other. Um, we did discuss about the iceberg stuff. We all acknowledge um, that social isolation, yes, tip of the iceberg, but also that social isolation can then lead on to serious social anxiety, etc. So it's about sort of addressing it proactively. Um, what else did we talk about? Um, we did get some further, to add further to the directory discussion, we did get some advice that there's Lifeline also have a service finder. And uh, again, uh, just to reiterate what I heard Sean say is I was really grateful to hear, have the conversation with everyone, so thank you. Great. And Chris? Yeah, thanks, JR. Um, I yeah, I think I'd like to thank the group as well. Um, uh, some invaluable contributions. I think uh, James was in the group when um, what one of the key themes came up uh, for us, which was around, um, it was on the back of a conversation around, uh, you, you know, how people communicate loneliness without stating, uh, I'm feeling lonely, and then how you don't create a system there. Uh, with a sort of loneliness navigator that that, that, that becomes the, the the touch point. Um, I think one of the most uh, interesting uh, uh, and powerful things that came out of that group uh, at the end was very much, it was a conversation, a discussion about how we create intentional environments for social connectedness, opportunistic um, and incidental connections. Uh, we used um, case study three uh, which is Sylvie, which is a very uh, case study. It's about a rural situation in a rural community. So how do you create those, um, which, you know, as everyone on this panel knows, uh, talking about the creation of environments to facilitate social inclusion is a whole different conference, <laughs> not the sort of 20 minute conversation that we had a chance to have then. Um, so yeah, I think they were the key takeaways for me from my group. Wonderful. Um, okay. Any closing thoughts from any of the moderators um, before we say farewell? Um, just, just one thing, which I think was really heartening, and it was great to just hear about the Lifeline Service Finder because there's a lot of um, great resources out there, and certainly people in in the group that that I had the pleasure of moderating were, were had lots of great ideas. There were so many ideas about you know where you could connect, where you could go to. Um, and even in some very like rural and regional communities, resources from the council, the resources at libraries, um, you know, online tools to access um, services and supports for people, it, that they are there. It's it's just looking for them and finding them so that you actually have access. And and certainly from just from the conversation, I think the the people in the group had so many different ideas and thoughts about how they could link people 
um, to services and supports that would really make a difference um, to their connection um, and you know address isolation. So if there's a lot of stuff out there um, across the board. Great. Okay, well, I suppose uh, thank you to the moderators in particular and um, uh, did a great job. Obviously, everyone had their own style, but it was a pleasure to watch each of you um, with your groups. Um, look, for me, I found it particularly interesting because I know a lot of those people in those case studies, um, whether they're from New South Wales or from Queensland. And it's always interesting to hear how other people talk about people you know. Just uh, it's a bit surreal sometimes. Um, one of the things that identity thing comes up a, a fair bit and I definitely get that. And it's not just the identity of the people who are actually uh, getting the social scripts. It's also the identity of um, the link worker in the Australian context is an interesting thing. Uh, we don't really have that link worker model as Sean said here. So it tends to be the nurses and the, the psychologists and the social workers and the doctors doing that, that prescribing uh, and linking all in one fell swoop. And it's a bit outside of the comfort zone sometimes because we all have scopes of practice and ways we work. So it's a bit unusual to have to have that secondary identity. Um, and I know colleagues at University of Queensland, uh, like uh, Genevieve Dingle, published papers on this more recently in terms of that sort of complexity of the link worker role in the Australian context. But um, James, your thoughts? Look. I mean, from a from a general practice perspective, and again from a health perspective, um, when you've got sort of um, eighty to ninety percent of health outcomes determined by the social determinants of health, why we like there isn't a specific you know social worker workforce incentive payment for GP clinics to have social workers co-located just boggles me. Um, so you know we we have that for nurses for chronic disease, but when addressing the sort of underlying social determinants of those chronic diseases. Um, it's it's a shame that we don't have that level of integration of that kind of workforce, that kind of skill set, um, with what is unfortunately, you know, the front door of healthcare in Australia, and where often those in greatest need tend to only go to um, because of you know their health literacy issues, etc. Um, I was struck by a, an interesting dichotomy in the chat groups, so. Um, in uh, Chris's group, um, uh, I think uh, her name was Jenny, um, in the chat, she was talking about um, a, a quote by um, Cormac Russell. And he was talking about someone who worked, uh, he worked with who feared being a burden more than he feared being lonely. Um, and I think this is about like how we, how we deliver this in a palatable way and um, how he said he'd engage with someone with that fear was that he suggested shifting to you are needed not you are needy um the community needs you rather than you need you know the community and i think for a huge percentage of those with um lower kind of intensity health needs uh or low inten lower intensity social assistance needs that kind of um bringing their value to the community is something which um i fear when this is rolled out in scale um, may be lacking that kind of angle. Yet in, um, in Christine's group, uh, I think it was Marie uh, mentioned that on the other hand, the identity as a, 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 of someone being an injured worker could be very validating. I am injured. I had an injury. I need to recover. It was significant. Um, it affected my functioning and therefore they needed to recreate themselves, which was a very different uh, kind of, um, you know, uh, and I think from a from a user experience perspective, you know, the idea of a someone being a consumer, uh, very transactional, and their engagement with whatever is uh, sort of offered to them uh, depends on how they how they how how easily they identify as uh, as a consumer, as an injured person, as someone in need of social assistance, or someone that the community is in of you know is in need of um and i think from a my, my subjective opinion is is to catch the most amount of people that could benefit from this you know mm -hmm. you you'd focus it a large proportion of it, of it on the lower intensity uh you know and that is really sort of to me early early low intensity mental health uh management when we're looking at 
you know, the community needs new. You don't necessarily identify someone who's, you know, objectively socially isolated or lonely, but um, they'd certainly need your skills, assets and experience. Um, so it was interesting to sort of hear about the different ways. And, I, and I, I'm sure in the rollout, there's, it's much easier to set up a framework around those who are consumers uh, and identify as such. But I, I suspect that to be the minority. What do you think, Jaya? I think you, you raise an interesting point. It's um, as a community, uh, uh, you know, uh, Australia is a community oriented sort of country. And I sometimes wonder, it is sometimes easier to be in those groups to actually deal with the stigma that's attached to everything. We have a long way to go as a society towards actually making every place just safe and normal to be you. Um, and it's a bit of a shame, to be honest, because um, the stigma is everywhere, to be honest. Um, so I, I guess... Um, Reflecting on some of the qualitative literature that one of my PhD students, Thames and Thomas, she's um, working through at the minute, she's pulled out vignettes of people saying, yeah, I, I didn't think I was interesting and I didn't feel I had a place to talk. Um, and now now I realize I do have something to say and people do want to hear it. And thinking back to the, uh, the workers' compensation work with Christine years ago when she was on the government side of the coin, um, it, a lot of it was just, I forgot how to socialize. I didn't, you know, socialization is like a muscle that I haven't worked. I don't have a place to use it. I don't know what I'm doing anymore and I'm not competent. So uh, there's comfort in finding other people who are going through the same sort of difficulties, but at some point it'd be nice as a cohesive society if we could actually somehow pave the way that everyone can just actually be themselves and they don't have to, to go into that identity group formation thing and they can just be. But anyways, that's a whole separate side comment. Um, so, yeah, no, I think it's been a fantastic session. And thank you to, to everyone. I think we're nearing time. So um, I might just... What, what do the others think in terms of uh, um, Sean and Christine, Chris and Kayleen, in terms of when, when we're implementing this, you know, is it to consumers? Is it to mental health consumers? Is it to the general population? Would... Would you, would you use the service? Would you engage with it, you know? Um, how, should, should we lean it towards health or lean it towards for everyone, you know? I think I'd probably, um, if I can jump in, I'd probably take, um, I guess, a, a population health approach in terms of uh, primary prevention, secondary prevention, et cetera. And uh, to be honest, I think this applies to the whole population because I suppose in a population um, health thinking you want to catch people before they fall so if I think about sort of um, our case with Nick for example you know his his whole sort of um, persona orientated around his work colleagues lost you know when then sort of lost his colleagues etc and a couple of people had suggested around men's sheds and these types of things but I suppose you know if, if there's that piece of how do we build capacity and I think JR you and James both raised this in sort of as we talked originally is sort of helping build some of those connections so that people you know things do go wrong that there are other, there are other avenues because i think the problem is when things do go wrong people are less inclined to reach out and so i suppose in my view anyway it's catching people before they fall and sort of how do we build capacity into the system at the different levels um easier said than done i know um but i suppose i take that type of view I mean, in the broader sense, I think we could all link each other into what, what opportunities exist. And if we were just nice, compassionate communities, we could skip most of this um, paperwork and bureaucracy and spending. So from on behalf of whoever is stuck at the government paying for bills for this, honestly, uh, I think a neighborhood could sort most of it out. And most of us shouldn't be here talking about this. That's that's my real yeah. 10 cent bottom line. But unfortunately... <laughs> Uh, we'll have to spend money and put complicated frameworks and then look at safety and governance and then spend tons of money to, to be good people to each other. So anyway. Um, um, I've just popped in the chat. It was so nice to see from Francis in the chat and also Kayleen, your group brought up the sort of um, issue with men in approaching this. And I've just popped in uh, a link to uh, Mr. Perfect, um, who's got a fantastic men's health directory. Um, so if you, if you, if you can't find that link in the chat, it's, um, mrperfect.org.au and this guy has compiled um, a mo most amazing um, directory specific for sort of um, you know 
men with difficulty in terms of starting that conversation and engaging with others. And yeah, that's great to see that theme brought up today as well. James, James if I may, can I interject too that we've just, Kay and I are in Canberra today and actually um, so uh, Simon Jarvis, who's the CEO of Mentoring Men, um, has been with us. And again, you know, we had the same conversation come up um, in terms of this. I think, yeah, it's really important to sort of understand what resources are out there and how to connect people. And, you know, one size doesn't fit all. So different um, different resources are going to be working for different people. So I think the more that we know about what's out there, the more we know what we can connect people to. Okay. Uh, so uh, probably just nearing time. So uh, thank you to all of our uh, moderators, all of our guests and colleagues and uh, the people making a difference every day um, for everyone in their communities. Um, thanks a ton for joining us for this Collab Lab. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session and took something out of it. And uh, you can continue this discussion tomorrow in the, uh, the networking hub. The, uh, the information's on the screen there. Uh, I'll be at one of the tables if you want to talk more. Also, I'll just put a link on the side, the uh, MHPN National Network on Social Prescribing. Uh, there's a link you can click to, to register interest there. Uh, come have a chat tomorrow. There's also a guided uh, mindfulness session in 15 minutes at 5.15. Uh, and don't miss this evening's panel discussion, the nexus between climate change and mental health at 6 p.m. Melbourne, Sydney and Hobart time. Uh, please complete the survey about the session uh, to the right of your screen um, or the one you'll receive via email next week about the whole conference just to inform future conferences. And again, on um, behalf of myself and um, James, thanks so much for your time and uh, feel free to reach out uh, to discuss anything else. And thank you for whoever uh, suggested I should be Prime Minister. Appreciate it. Uh, Mum would be happy. All right. Have a great day. Thank you.